she says, I'm going to Singapore. Then she says to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Australia. I said, what do you do? So she told me. Then she said, what do you do? And I said, well, <laughs> I work for a global enterprise. She said, do you? I said, yes, I do. I said, we've got outlets in nearly every country of the world. She says, have you? I said, yes, we have. I said, we've got orphanages, we've got hospices, we've got hospitals, we've got homeless shelters. We've got schools, uh, colleges. We do reconciliation work, justice work, marriage work. I said, basically, we look after people from birth to death, and we deal in the area of behavioural alteration. <laughs> and she went, wow. Oh, oh, wow, was so loud. People all turned round and looked at us, and she goes, what's it called? I said, it's called The Church, have you heard of it? <laughs> but then we began to talk, you know, on the way to Singapore, and um, it became very obvious that this woman's understanding of Christianity was a misunderstanding. And I think that's true today for many people, that many people's understanding of Christianity is a misunderstanding. And uh, that's why it's important to know, well, what is it we believe when we say Christian? What, what, what do we mean by that? And so I'm going to explain that now. I'm going to, and the way I'm going to explain it is that I'm going to explain to you why I'm a Christian and tell you why you should be a Christian and why everyone should be a Christian. The first reason, I'm going to give you four reasons. I could give you a lot more reasons, but you know, I'm giving you four reasons at the time that we've got. The first reason why I'm a Christian is because Christianity is true. So many of the words that we sang here, and maybe you were looking at the words and wondering what they are, they're true. They are actually true. It's interesting that when the first Russian astronaut returned from space, first interview, first question, did you see God? He said, no, I did not. And the Soviet Union at that time heralded this as proof that God did not exist. When the first American astronaut returned from space, first interview, fourth question, did you see God? He said, I would have seen God had I stepped out of my spacesuit. <laughs> That's pretty clever, actually. Isn't it? You know, so the Russian and the American had two different understandings of the word God. Today, I think many people ask the wrong questions. If you ask the wrong question, you can never get the right answer. Um, the question we should be asking is, has God revealed himself? Well, according to the Bible, God has. God has revealed himself in creation. The Bible says the whole of creation is crying out to get our attention. And it's interesting that you've got beautiful creation in this part of England. It's beautiful. This is a beautiful town, city, area. It's beautiful. Many people enjoy creation, but they're not interested in the creator. God has spoken through creation and he speaks to us through creation, but God has spoken to us through history on many, many occasions. But God's greatest revelation of himself for all people, for all time, for all cultures was in Jesus Christ. The invisible God became visible in Jesus. The unknowable God became knowable in Jesus. The intangible God became knowable in Jesus. God revealed himself to us in Jesus. Now, honestly, I, I, I could stand here, I could, and tell you and teach you the evidence of Jesus 
And honestly, I could, I could do that for about eight hours at least, if not more. And to give you the facts, I, I wrote a book called Jesus Christ, the Truth, giving the historical historicity of Jesus Christ, the facts about Jesus Christ, the evidence for Jesus Christ, the evidence of the fulfillment of the 322 prophecies in the Old Testament, the evidence for the resurrection. Um, I, I've written it in this book, Jesus Christ, the truth. And so many people don't know the evidence. And so many people ignore the evidence. Uh, and I, I would encourage you, you know, pick up, a, pick up this book, pick up a book like this book, and, and really get to grips with the evidence. It's true. Now, if that, what I've just said is true, that I'm telling you it's true, the implications are phenomenal. If this is true, if your life here is a blip on the eternal screen, that there is an eternity, the implications of Christianity being true are phenomenal. For you, your family, your friends, the implications are huge. I am a Christian because I am utterly, I am totally convinced that Christianity is true. It really is true. I've spoken in 102 universities around the world. I've debated with professors. I've done all sorts of things. There was one place I spoke at. The student comes up to me and he goes, oh, I, I enjoyed your lecture, Mr. John, uh, but I can't believe in anything I don't understand. I said, really? He said, yes. I said, what are you studying? He said, agriculture. I said, oh, well, tell me this. How is it possible for a black cow to eat green grass and produce white milk? <laughs> I said, do you actually understand that? He goes, no, I don't. I said, well, there's loads of things you don't understand. There? There's loads of things you don't understand. You know, and I, I was an agnostic when I was a student in London in 1975, but I encountered the truth and the truth transformed my thinking, my mind, my heart, my life absolutely transformed it. And I'm still a Christian today because I'm utterly convinced. So I'm a Christian because it's true. You should be a Christian because it's true. Okay, the second reason why I'm a Christian is because I am a broken person. That's the second reason. I'm a broken person. So are you. Every one of us is broken. Now, there was this mother um, who said to her husband, darling, look after Annie for me, their little daughter. I need to get on. So the father said, yes, of course. And he thought, what can he do to occupy his little girl? Flicking through a magazine, he sees a map of the world, has an idea. Annie, watch what I'm going to do. He cut the map of the world into small squares and muddled them on the floor and said, Annie, I want you to put the squares back together again like a puzzle. The map of the world. So he put bit. This later, she goes, Daddy, I've done it. She's like, well, she couldn't have done it, but let me have a look. Goes and has a look. All the squares were put in exactly the right place. He said, How did you know where to put all the squares? Ah, she said, when you were cutting the map out, I looked on the other side and I saw a picture of a man and a woman. And I thought if I could put the man and the woman back together again, I could put the world back together again. <laughs> you see. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Repeat that after me. The heart, no, 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 after me. <laughs> Following the instructions is important. The heart of the human problem, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Is the problem of the human heart. Just say that to someone tomorrow randomly, just randomly. You know, you're in a coffee, coffee shop or something. Did you know? That the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. You'll have a very interesting conversation. <laughs> now, I'm sure you would agree 
that there are problems in the world today. Do you agree with that? Yeah, of course. Does anyone disagree? Of course not. Right, there's problems globally, socially, domestically, personally. Now, many governments of the world, many social agencies, many charities are endeavoring to do what they can to alleviate the symptoms. But if you try and alleviate the symptoms, you will always have the symptoms unless you deal with the root cause. The root cause is the heart. The Bible said we all have a heart disease. We all have heart dis-ease. The Bible says it is out of the human heart that come the seeds that affect and infect us and our relationships, our families, our communities, our countries, our continents. It's out of the human heart. I went to speak at Oxford University for, I gave a whole series of lectures for a whole week. And this student comes up to me, it was after the final lecture that I'd given. And, and, um, and he goes, oh yeah, I've really enjoyed listening to you, Mr. John. And I'm here, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And then he goes, then he goes, but I personally believe Christianity is a crutch. And I looked at him and I thought, I hope you break your legs. <laughs> now, come on, let's be honest. We all have random thoughts. You know, you know, if, if everyone could read the little bubbles that, you know, while, while we're talking to people, you know. So I'm, I'm talking to you and I think, I hope you break your legs. And, um, so then I said to him, if you broke both of your legs, would you appreciate the use of a wheelchair to get around? He said, yes, I would. I said, if you broke one leg, would you appreciate of crutches to get around? He said, yes, I would. I said, I'm, I'm a broken person. So are you. I'm so pleased I can lean on Jesus while he's putting me back together again. Yeah. You see, so when people say to me, Christianity is a crutch, I go, oh, you do know something about Christianity. Because it is. Christianity is a crutch. Because we're leaning on Jesus. You know, I'm a Christian because it's true. I'm a Christian because I am broken. I am broken. You're broken. We're all broken. There's no one that's not broken. There is no one who doesn't have an infected heart. There's no one who doesn't have a diseased, diseased heart. And the thing about that is, I mean, well, let me illustrate it to you in a slightly different way. Just imagine you passed out of this life. This is just an analogy. You woke up in a theater, sitting there on your own, in front of you is a huge screen. All of a sudden the doors open, an angel flies in, comes up to you and says, welcome to the theater of judgment, relax. <laughs> watch the screen now there on the screen you see your life everything you ever did here on earth everything you ever said and everything you ever thought it's all there those are what the bible calls the sins of commission but you also see the sins of omission in other words all the things that you should have done but you didn't do at the end of the film is your recovering the angel comes back and says, relax, there's going to be a second showing. All the people that were featured in the film of your life are all waiting outside. And we're just going to let them in to view your life a second time. God, how would you feel if your life were judged on that basis? That is exactly how God judges us in an instant. I don't know about you, me, I would not want a private viewing, let alone a public viewing of my life. Honestly, I don't need convincing that I've thought, said and done things that I shouldn't have. And most people think that stuff doesn't matter. They're wrong. 
that stuff does matter. It disconnects us from God. And it works a bit like an overdraft in the bank account. If you've got an overdraft, I've got an overdraft, you can't help me, I can't help you. The only one who can help us is someone in credit. Why am I a Christian? Because it's true. Why am I a Christian? Because I'm a broken person. Thirdly, why am I a Christian? Because of what Jesus did for me. Jesus was the only one in credit. And Jesus came into this world to do something for us. Uh, my wife, Kelly, and I have got um, three sons. When our firstborn, Michael, he was about four, he and I went to buy a Mother's Day present for his mum. And he and I walked around the stores and we walked into one particular store. As we walked into the store, there was this huge sign. I mean, it was gigantic, literally, kind of as you walked into the, whoa, and it read, do not touch. All breakages must be purchased. Why did I not just walk out? I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? I've got a four-year-old. Not only have I got a four-year-old, I know what I'm like. And so we're in the store, and it, there's something about that. Those words, do not touch, that you kind of feel are quite magnetic, aren't they? <laughs> Where you almost want to rebel. You want to express rebellion. You want to be able to touch with your elbow. <laughs> you see, I couldn't. I can do it if I want to. But a four-year-old goes a bit more than just the touch of the elbow. And I saw it out of the corner of my eyes. He knocked this thing over. And it was like, it, was, it, it felt like slow motion <laughs> when it was almost like, oh, no! And it kind of like fell. <laughs> Smashed. The manager, I don't know where the manager came from, <laughs> you know, beam me up, Scotty. It was like, he was there. And he pointed to the sign. He didn't say anything, he just pointed to the sign. Do not touch. All breakages must be purchased. And I said, I didn't do it, he did it. And I thought, why don't I just walk out? Let Michael deal with it. <laughs> I didn't do it. He did it. He can pay for the damages. Now, there's no way, no way that four-year-old Michael could pay for the damages. Only his daddy could pay for the damages. There's no way you and I can pay for the damages. Amen. Only our Heavenly Father through Jesus can pay for the damages. And that is ex exactly what Jesus did for you and he did for me. I love the story of the famous artist who went back to the very small rural community where he was born and brought up. And he's walking around looking at the village stores and there's an antique store, looks in the window, cannot believe what he sees. In the window was one of his masterpieces. It was a painting that he painted years before he was famous. The frame was broken, the, the picture was scratched and dirty, but it was his. But he couldn't go into the antique store and say, that's my painting, give it back to me. If he wanted it back, he had to buy it back before he could clean it, restore it <coughs> and reframe it. That's what Jesus did. Jesus Christ died on a cross to buy you and me back so that we could be cleaned, restored, and reframed. Reframed. It's as if he offered a check, signed with his own blood, to say, here is the check to clear your overdraft, to set you free to give us forgiveness from the past, new life today, and our hope for the future. I am a Christian because it's true. I am a Christian because I'm a broken person and only Jesus can fix me. 
I am a Christian because of what Jesus Christ did for me. And why should you be a Christian? Because it's true, because you're a broken person. Only Jesus can fix you, and only Jesus died to pay for the damages, to give you forgiveness, new life, and a hope. Why am I a Christian? Because it works. I've been a Christian since the 9th of February, 1975. I'm still a Christian today. It works. Christianity has changed my life, has transformed my life. I've seen God work in my life, in, in Killy's life, in our family's life. I've seen God work. I've seen him work. Our next door neighbours, they not Christians, and they called Killy and I the neighbours from heaven. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's nice, isn't it? Well, we wouldn't want to be the neighbours from the other side, would we? And the lady had a stroke. And as a consequence of the stroke, she fell into a coma. And she was in our local hospital where we live, but she got transferred to a specialist hospital. Um, what's it called? John Ratcliffe in Oxford, which is like an hour away from us. So the local hospital is like 10 minutes, and now she's an hour away, okay. The daughter comes round, speaks to Killy, and says, we've just spoken with the consultants. And the consultants said uh, that mum, that her mum, is brain dead. There's no brain activity at all. So she's on a life support machine just for five days, so that the family can go and say goodbye and then turn off the machine so she dies. Kimmy said to the daughter, can we visit your mother before she dies? And the daughter said, please, would you visit my mother? Because my mother was so fond of you, that would be a great thing. So the only time I could go because of my schedule was the fifth day. So now we're driving to Oxford. And I, I confess my humanity. I was in a bit of a bad mood. I'm like, I can't believe you got transferred to Oxford. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, we got to drive now an hour. And, and you know what it's like when you drive to a hospital you don't know? Like, where do you park your car? You know, where do you pay for parking your car? And it's all, it feels stressful, doesn't it? Anyway, so I'm kind of a bit stressy and all that. Anyway, so. Yeah, that's a bit of confession, right? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't condone this attitude, by the way. And um, we arrive at the hospital. She's in intensive care. We um, go into her room and we walk in and I say, hello, Joyce. I said, it's the neighbours from heaven. <laughs> and uh, she's got tubes everywhere. According to the doctors, she's brain dead. Following morning, turning it off. She's going to die. So, you know, I thought, well, I'll just go anoint her with oil, do the last rites, let her go. And um, so, <laughs> so I, I said, now, Joyce, Joyce, what we're going to do, so I start talking to her, Joyce, what we're going to do is we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Okay. So I Managed to get her hand, I mean, she had these tubes everywhere. Managed to get her hand. I held Killy's hand, Killy held her other hand. So I said, Joyce, Killy and I are star, okay? So we'll pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. And when we said your kingdom come, she woke up. <laughs> It was scary. <laughs> Tilly me wet herself. Because it was like it was like slow motion. It was like, <laughs> like that. Oh hello, Joyce. <laughs> 
So we, I, we went back and we went back and I said to our husband, I said, she woke up. <laughs> he goes, no, she didn't. And she said, he said, J. John, you should never joke. <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not joking. She woke up. He goes, she didn't. <laughs> I go, she did. <laughs> he goes, no, she's brain dead. I said, well, she did. <laughs> and he's like, no, she didn't. And then uh, I'm walking out, she didn't. <laughs> anyway, she came back like 10 days later. Oh, right, live, live for another 12 years. <laughs> Kelly and I prayed for her to receive Christ, and I, I took a funeral a couple of months ago. Oh, wow. Do you know, huh? She's 90. She's 90. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they told us she was going to die, so we went round, prayed, received Christ, died. Anyway, I could tell you so many stories like that. Oh, goodness, so many stories like that. I, I have seen the power of Jesus Christ. I have seen the presence of Jesus Christ transform people's lives, transform people's relationships, transform people's communities. I have seen miracles, miracles. I was speaking in one meeting, and at this meeting, uh, this guy comes up to me after the meeting, and he goes, uh, he goes, well, first of all, he interrupted me while I was speaking. And he said, excuse me, Mr. John. So I'm like, yes. <laughs> he said, do you believe Jesus can heal today? I said, yes, I do. Yes, I do. And okay, that was that. Okay, right, press on with the talk. Anyway, he comes up to me afterwards. He goes, um, I'm the guy that asked whether Jesus heals today. I said, oh yeah. And he says, well, I'm a doctor. I said, oh, okay. He goes, my wife's very sick. And um, can, you, can you pray for her? I said, yes, of course. So I thought he meant his wife very sick, his wife's at home, say a little prayer for her. You know, I thought, oh, I'll say a little prayer for her. He goes, well, let me take you to her now. I said, what do you mean? She's here. Yeah, 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 she's here. So he, he's a medical doctor and he explained to me that her digestive system had, had died. It's a particular condition. And she had not eaten through her mouth I don't know, something like 10 years had never eaten through her mouth. So it was all liquid. And um, so they asked me to pray for her. So anointed her, prayed for her. Anyway, a couple of days later, they contact us. By the way, prayed for her in the name of Jesus, not in the name of J. John, name of Jesus. And um, she gets in the car after we pray for her with her husband, and she says to her husband, I'm healed. He goes, how do you know? She goes, I know. Mm. How do you know? I know. <laughs> so she says, on the way home, let's go and have a Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> now, remember, he's a doctor. He goes, no. Margaret, her name is Margaret Poe. Margaret, no, no, you haven't eaten for 10 years, right? Like, like if we're going to eat anything, we might start with soup, yeah? Yeah, because otherwise you're choked to death. No, I'm healed. I've been longing for a Mexican. I want spicy food. Anyway, cut a long story short, she goes and sees her consultant, like, within days. He examines her, tests her, and he wrote on her medical file, this is a miracle. Amen. Okay. Look, we live in a world of miracle and mystery. Yeah, and there are some times when we don't quite understand certain things that happen. Uh, and I, I, I wrote a, a different book during, during lockdown. I wrote this book. Will, will, I, will I be fat in heaven? <laughs> What I did, I took 38 questions. I took 38 questions. People say, how long did it take you to write? I said, well, it did get much longer than lockdown. I said, because it took me 40 years. So I've been thinking about these questions for 40 years. You know, why do babies die? Uh, why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, do babies go to heaven when they die? You know, does an 
aborted fetus go to heaven, uh, do all religions lead to God, uh, suffering, and all those. And I, and I try to really engage with every question thoughtfully. You know, so I, you know, please don't think that when we Christians say, oh yeah, Jesus heals, that we're oblivious uh, to the suffering in the world and uh, the pain that so many people endure. And sometimes you pray and you don't see an answer. We live in a world of miracle and mystery, but there is something in our faith where we can trust Jesus that ultimately he's sovereign. He reigns and rules. It will all work for good in the end, even though we can't see how the tapestry is being weaved. Um, but if you want to engage with some of those questions, um, maybe that, that's, that's helpful. Look, I'm a Christian because it's true. I'm a Christian because I'm broken, only Jesus can fix me. I'm a Christian because Jesus did something for me that, that heals me, that saves me. I'm a Christian because it works. Why should you be a Christian? Well, first of all, to all those of you that are Christians, they're your first four reasons why you're a Christian, just to reinforce your faith, yeah? You're a Christian because it's true. You're a Christian because you're broken, only Jesus can fix you. You are a Christian uh, because Jesus did something for you. You're a Christian because it works. You've seen him work. Now, for those of you who are not yet Christian or you're not sure whether you are. There's just four reasons why you should embrace this. The word Christian has got the word Christ in it. And if you remove the word Christ from the word Christian, you're left with I-A-N. Ian isn't gonna help you. <laughs> He's not gonna help you. Yeah. Um, some, some years ago, I, I did a cordon bleu cookery course. I just wanted to, I fancied doing a, I, I love it. Well, Killy's a brilliant cook, but I, we love, we're foodie people. So I did this course and I specialised in desserts. And so I turned up on this course and there were 16 people on the course, 15 women and me. And, um, uh, and we're doing, yeah, desserts. And, um, and I'm like, this is a bit of my therapy time. I'm just gonna have time. But, and I, I have to make the dessert, cook the dessert, and then I could take the dessert home. You know, it was great. And uh, a lady came up to me and tried to talk to me. And I'm like, I can't, you know, you do say we don't multitask. Well, we don't multitask, so buzz off, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I'm trying to make a souffle. And you want to engage with me in conversation. But anyway, they all explain that. Oh, tell us about you. Well, like, you know, I, oh. anyway, and then, and then I, I, I'd say, they say, what do you do? And it's like, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> you know, I don't want to tell you what I do. But then it's difficult, isn't it, when you're going week after week after week. You've got, you've got to be a bit polite, don't you? And then it's like, oh, well, I'm actually a minister. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, most of them, it wasn't no. Most of them were like, are you an effing minister? <laughs> I am, actually, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then but this was the interesting thing, because I got to know these women. And, and, uh, and I'd say, oh, do you go to church? You know, just a little simple question. Do you go to church? Oh, yes, I do, yeah. Oh, where do you go? Oh, <laughs> oh I can't quite remember the name. <laughs> and, you know, all of them were like that. And all of them called themselves Christians. All of them did because they went to church when they were hatched. They went to church when they were matched. And they might go to church when they're dispatched. <laughs> but what's interesting is two out of those three occasions, they carried in. They don't get it, isn't it? They only go once out of choice. And yet they all thought they were Christians. Listen, you can't be a Christian unless you're connected with Christ. Yeah. You know, I love the analogy of, of, of the car. Think of this, the car of your life, okay? The car of your life. So using that analogy, uh, to be a Christian means Christ is in the car. 
He's in your life. He's in the car of your life. So if he's not in your car, in, in just a couple of minutes, I'll give you an opportunity to invite him in your life. But for the majority of us, he's in the car. He's in the car. Great, he's in the car. Where's he in the car? Huh? Where's he in the car? Do you drive? Do you drive your car to church? Unlock the boot. Get Jesus out for religious happy hour. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the service, <laughs> get back in there. <laughs> you know, because it's it's very easy. It's very easy to say, "Oh yeah, oh, I'm Christian. I'm Christian." You know, I go to that filling filling thing. You know. <laughs> don't get filled I get filled but then the rest of the week I'm definitely not Christian <laughs> you know now other people are like no J John is not in the boot he's on the back seat all oh, right okay a bit of a passenger and others of you are oh, he's in the front passenger seat bit of a companion but still a passenger now you're one step step ahead of me in your mind now you're thinking we know where you're going with this analogy J John you don't actually and, <laughs> You, you think I'm going to say, is Jesus in the driving seat? I am. Is Jesus in the driving seat of the car of your life? Every one of you that thought, yes, he is in the driving seat. Got one more question. Are you a backseat driver? <laughs> the car gets to an intersection. Jesus turns left. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm going down the road of forgiveness. I don't want to forgive. You know, did you ever see the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding? Yeah, well, I, I'm Greek. When, when that movie came out, some friends of mine said, John, is that what Greek culture's like? I said, no, it's worse. <laughs> I mean, my mother is a travel agent for guilt trips. I don't know if you can identify with that. You know, if I want to feel guilty, call my mother. And, um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm... I'm instructed by Jesus to love her and forgive her and all this sort of stuff. And sometimes I don't want to do that. Sometimes the car is at a roundabout and Jesus turns right. Where are you going? I'm going down the road of generosity. Come on, I don't want to be generous. <laughs> what, what do you mean? I've, I've, I've come here tonight. Now you want me to put something in this truck here? <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> I mean, you don't get invited to someone's house for dinner and then they go, it's the bucket. <laughs> Did you enjoy the meal? It's the bucket. What is there? He goes, like, you know, like, where did they get the bucket off? Now he's going to cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, that's what I thought when they said the bucket. I don't know, what did you think? You know, similar thoughts, you know. But anyway, you know, sometimes we think like that. We, th we think we're generous. We squeeze the pound so tightly, we make the queen cry. <laughs> you know, so many people haven't heard the Sermon on the Amount. <laughs> By the way, you know, uh, there are a few expenses tonight. <laughs> Rob and Laura are like, you know, they put us up in the hotel, so someone needs to pay for that. I'm not. I'm not. Um, so if you feel led by the spirit to do that, you know, just go and speak to Rob and Laura. But listen, no, uh, it is about putting him in the driving seat. And part of what the filling station does is, is help um, affirm and, and reinforce uh, faith and help to put Jesus in the driving seat. It, it guides us to know how to put the petrol in, how to, you know, fine tune the engine and all these things. So how do you know, how do you know if Jesus is in the, is in the driving seat? How do you know if he's first, F-I-R-S-T? Ask five questions. These five questions. F-I-R-S-T. Is he first F in my finances? Am I a generous person? Because God's generous. Is he first in my finances? I. Is he first in my interests? R. Is he first in my relationships? 
S, is he first in my schedule? T, is he first in my troubles? Now, if you can say, oh, he's first in my finances, interest, relationships, schedule, trouble. Wow, that's a good sign. He's first in your life. And when he's first in your life by his spirit, his spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. But if you can't say he's first in those five areas, it probably means you need to reposition Jesus. Yes. You know, when we take our cars, don't we? I, I, when we take our car for an MOT, I'm like, oh, I hope I don't get that call. It, and the call's normally about 10 a.m. 10 a. You know, you drop the car off at about eight, you get a call about 10. And, like, oh. and then the call goes, oh, it's the garage. And oh, no. I hope it's just brake pads, isn't it? You know, it's just brake pads. And then they go, it's brake pads, it's the windscreen wiper. You just hope it's not a new engine, isn't it? And um, but isn't it interesting? We take our cars to, to realign them, but we don't often realign our lives. You know, so, you know, for all of us, whether we're Christian or not yet Christian, we all need to respond to the truth of this. So I received Christ on the 9th of February, 1975, 10 o'clock. I remember it. It was a significant moment. And I'm going to invite you, if you're, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, or you don't know whether you are, or maybe you used to be, why don't you say tonight, it's nearly five past nine, on Thursday the 2020, you say, hey, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. 2022, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. 2022, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. Christ. And if you want to do that in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand up. That's what I'm going to ask you to do, stand up. Now, I'm not asking you to stand up to embarrass you. Honestly, I wouldn't want to do that. But I want you to stand up here amongst Christians so that tomorrow you can stand up out there. Because if you can't stand up in here, you'll never stand up out there. So I want you to stand up here to say, actually, yes, I do want to stand. Um, and anyone else that wants to reposition Jesus, maybe as you've listened tonight, you thought, I know he's in my life, but if I'm really honest, I need to reposition him. Well, what a great opportunity tonight to say, hey, actually, I'm going to have my MOT tonight. You stand up as well. As your way of saying, I'm going to reposition Jesus in the driving seat and recommit my life. When you stood up, I will pray a prayer and um, I will ask you to pray the prayer. When you prayed the prayer, I will pray for you. That's it. And then we've got some resources for you that we want to give to you um, after we close. That's what we want to do. Close your eyes if you don't mind. You don't have to, but just so that you're not distracted. Don't worry about people lying inside of you. Would you like to invite Jesus into your life? Maybe for the first time. Maybe after a, a period of absence. Do you need to reposition Jesus? If you want to do any of those, just please, could you stand up now? Please stand up. Just stand. Thank you. Great. Great to see you standing. Thank you very much. Well done for standing up. Great. Anyone else want to stand? Please take this moment now. Don't, don't miss this opportunity. Anyone else? Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, just before we pray, anyone else? Okay, great. Now, the rest of you that are sitting down, stand up, please. Now, look what just happened. Look what just happened. The, when you first stood up, it's kind of, it's quite vulnerable, isn't it? Because it's like, oh dear. And, and um, you know, you're a bit like, oh, some of the people around me are not standing up, I'm standing up. And I, that sense of slight isolation, but look what just happened. 
everyone stood up and what they're saying is we're standing with you Amen. we're standing with you you're not going to stand alone yeah. you don't have to stand alone out there we're standing with you and we're going to encourage you and we're going to help you so i'm going to pray a prayer i will pray this prayer phrase by phrase okay i will pray it once so you know the words Second time I pray it, please pray it with me out loud. And for all of us who love Jesus, join in, reaffirm your faith with this prayer. Here's the prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I bow before you now. I bow before you now. I acknowledge that you are the truth. I acknowledge that you are the truth. I know I have done many things wrong. I know I have done many things wrong. And I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse my life. Cleanse my life. Set me free from the past. Set me free from the past. I invite you into my life now. I invite you into my life now. Come into the driving seat of my life. Come into the driving seat of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your presence, your peace, and your power. Fill me with your presence, your peace, your power. Help me from this day on. Help me from this day on to build my life on you. To build my life on you. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Amen. Amen. A prayer for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I announce and I pronounce his forgiveness. May each one of you know the truth and the reality of the prayer that you have prayed. May you know his cleansing. May you know his presence. And we pray that you would protect us and help us as we endeavor to follow you. And we pray that in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. Just going to pray one more prayer. The Jesus that we've spoken about and the Jesus that we sang about. Um, yes, he is the truth. Yes, he is the way. Yes, he is the light. He is the great physician. And we thank God for medicine and doctors and nurses. Um, but sometimes we need a, a divine miracle. Now, if you're concerned about your health in any way, or you're concerned about the health of someone you love and they're not here, Put your hand now on your heart. That means you're representing yourself or someone else. Lord Jesus, we're asking you now as the great physician to release your healing balm on us and on those that we're representing. Where there is sickness, infection, we pray that you would flush it out of our bodies and out of the bodies of those we're representing. Where there is any kind of pain, we pray that that pain in the name of Jesus Christ would now be gone. Amen. Where there has been any kind of degeneration, we pray for regeneration, we pray for restoration. Amen. In body, in mind, and spirit. We speak healing. We speak health. We speak wholeness. And we pray, Lord Jesus, both for us and those we represent now, we pray that in this next 24 hours, you will continue to permeate us with your healing presence and balm, and that you would give us a tangible sign yes. of your healing yes. at work. And we pray we ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Just keep encouraging you to keep on, you know, 
pushing. I like, you know, pushing in with prayer. Push, pray until something happens. Just keep pushing in and doing that. Now, in a moment, we're going to kind of wrap up the meeting, um, maybe slightly differently than normal, but this is what we're going to do. Um, if you stood up, you were the first people that stood up. Um, what we'd like you to do is remain in your seats, okay? You remain in your seats. Um, if you would like prayer for healing or for something like that, please stay in your seats. Um, the rest of you, if you, can you, in a moment, when we wrap up, when Rob and Laura wrap up, please just go and mingle outside here in, or in the bar or wherever, but if you could vacate. And then what's going to happen is there, there's a team of people here um, and they will come to you wherever you're seated. Now, if you were the first people that stood up, we, we want to give you this little booklet that I've written. In fact, I'm giving you this, um, making the connection. We're going to give you a New Testament as well. Um, and we're going to pray for you, okay? Um, if you need prayer for healing or for something else, uh, then one of, one of the team will come and pray for you. So just stay seated. We want to make it easy for you and uh, we'll pray with you. And it's, it's great um, to do that. Sometimes it's a bit like, you know, a very important document. You sometimes need it countersigned. And in some ways, prayer is a little bit like that. You've prayed and we come along and say, okay, we're going to countersign this. And we're going to stand with you and pray these things with you. Um, so that's what we want to encourage. Uh, we have brought uh, a couple of, of those thoughts. I've mentioned two. One on Jesus, the one, will I be a fat in heaven? In fact, it sounds as an odd title, but what, what are we going to look like in heaven? Um, because if we've got, if we shrink to the perfect size, will we be recognized anyway? Uh, that took me a long time to think through. Um, and I asked, I asked 10 children to send me all their questions. Oh, goodness, they sent me about 100. Um, but I chose 30 of their questions, and I tried to answer their questions um, uh, simply, but not simplistically. Um, so if any of these books are of interest to you, um, wear a bit like boots. Buy two, get one through. <laughs> That's really good. Buy two, get one through. Listen, if any of you, want one of those books, but you actually, honestly, truthfully don't have any money, then just say to Kelly, and we'd gladly give you one. You know, we don't want anyone not to have a book if you honestly don't have any money. J just to let you know, God will know if you're telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really don't mind. I honestly don't mind. You can if you don't have the money, we'll give you a book, you know. Uh, you know, if you don't have any money, we'll give you all three books. It's like, you know, so, and if you've got lots of money, could you pay for the books that I'm going to tell you? No, but listen, one of the things I started during lockdown, going back March 2020, um, I wanted to encourage people on our mailing list. And I started writing an article called Heroes of the Faith. And well, I wrote one, and then I wrote one, and then I wrote one, and I haven't stopped. I think I've written 125. Uh, so every week I write an article. Um, it, it's only a thousand words uh, about someone who was a Christian and what they did for God. Uh, and now they're in heaven. And um, so if you want to sign up, you can sign up for those. It's free. Just go to canonjjohn.com front page, sign up every Saturday morning, 8am, you'll get that in your inbox and it will give you a faith lift. Well, I always get a faith lift writing them. And um, so just to help and encourage you on the journey. So I hope you've been inspired tonight. And um, Killy and I will be here, happy to meet with you. But please stay seated, those that stood. Please stay seated if you'd like prayer. And uh, let's see what God does. <laughs>